photographing models, a popular genre of photography since the mid-1800s. Now, things have changed quite a bit since then, and guess what? In the last couple of years, they've changed even more, a whole lot more. So I'm going to share with you a story about something that I recently said to a model, and as soon as I said it, I knew that I blew it. Stay tuned. Let's chat. Hey gang, Joe Edelman here, and welcome to another episode of The Last Frame Live. Tonight, it's all about models and the things photographers say, and well, you know what? Sometimes don't say. So we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Fact is, the world, it's evolving, just in case you hadn't noticed. And if you want to be more effective at directing your subjects, there are some things that you need to understand and pay attention to like it or not. So you know the drill. If you're watching live, please do me a favor. Leave a little comment in the chat. Let me know you're here and where you're watching from. If you're watching the replay, no sweat. Leave a comment below the video. Let me know you are here because otherwise I won't know you were here and let me know where you're tuning in from. All of you that are watching this, you're part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to Talk Chat every week. Okay, it's kind of cool, I gotta say, right? So for that, I'm gonna work really hard in the next 60 minutes to help you improve your photography. It would, of course, help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame Live if you share The Last Frame Live with your photography friends. You can click that share button, it's down there underneath the video, or you can go ahead and share the link which, my gosh, I was not prepared for. So it's lastframe.live. It's also underneath the video in the description, so you can catch it there. And Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest way to go ahead and, and get the word out. Okay, so I'm going to hold on to the story for just a few minutes. And by the way, definitely, for sure, have time for questions tonight. So I want to know what you shot for World Photography Day. I want to know how I can help you, problems, issues, challenges that you're having. And in case you didn't notice, if you're here live, up at the top of the chat window, there's a poll up there. Uh, and please be honest, your name doesn't show up, so nobody knows who you are when you fill out the poll. But the question is, do you understand, and I mean honestly understand, the differences between watt seconds, lumens, and Lux. And actually, I should have added guide number in there, but we'll leave that out for now. Please, if you're here, if you tune in during the show, I'm going to mention again, make sure you take that poll for me. I and, and I have a reason. I always have a reason, right? I have a reason behind it. I will explain it. And we're going to be doing some education in the near future because I'm on a mission when it comes to this topic. And it's a mission to help, well, to help me but also to help you. So I'll explain all that, right? So communicating with models. You know, one of the very frequent questions that I get from photographers is about directing models. How do I tell models the right thing? Now, unfortunately, that question is more often asked in the context of posing. Like, well, I want to pose a model. What's the right way to tell them what I want? So you all know my advice is forget the pose part, right? Pose, four-letter word. Remember what your mama taught you. Don't use four-letter words. Done. Pose connotates don't move. Don't move connotates stiff. Who wants that, right? Nobody wants that. So that's another topic, another discussion. But indeed, photographers seem to struggle with being able to communicate to a subject. And, and by the way, I'll probably wind up using the word subject and model interchangeably in the conversation tonight. It's all the same. So we could be talking about portraits. We could be talking about working with models. We could be talking about a fashion shot. We could be talking about an environmental portrait, family picture, even for that matter, brides and weddings, right? All that kind of stuff. If we're photographing people, 
this applies, right? So the challenge is, which photographers struggle with, is getting the idea in their head, out of their mouth, in a way that the subject understands and responds to and does what the photographer is looking for. So I'm going to give you some generalized suggestions, but I also want to give you a little bit of understanding. The reason why I'm going to give you generalized suggestions, you ought to know by now if you follow me, is because if I say do this, do this, and do this, even if you follow those directions, it will only work occasionally. And that's because every subject is different. And that's because words that come out of my mouth and work with me saying them won't necessarily work with you saying them. So it's more important that you understand how to come up with the words. If you understand how to come up with the words, you're empowered and you're able to do it on your own. You don't need me, right? So there's some things that you need to understand. First of all, some of this, we're going to start up at 50,000 feet. And we're going to work our way down. Photographing people in general, regardless of the context, whether it be weddings, whether it be portraits, whether it be fashion and beauty portraits like I do, whether we're talking about working with models, environmental portraits, you name it. 80% of the task, 80% is psychology. 20% is the photography part. Why do you think I keep harping on you? You got to practice. You got to know your gear. You got to read the camera manual. You have to be prepared because you need 80% of your bandwidth to be dealing with your subject. So the first mistake that so many photographers make is that word subject seems to get treated as if it's the same as an object. You know, if you're doing a product shot, you don't have to talk to the product shot. You don't have to make the product feel good about itself. You don't have to stroke its ego. You don't have to worry about the temperature of the studio that you're shooting at. You don't have to feed it. You don't have to give it drinks. It's just there, right? And it's going to do whatever you make it do. That is not how photographing a person works. So photographing a person, the number one lesson that I'm going to give you for being able to say the right things and give the right directions to your subjects. Be the subject. Seriously. Put yourself in your subject's shoes. Remember, if you've got an idea in your head, you've got the idea in your head. You know the idea. You understand the idea. The real challenge is what is the idea and how well are you communicating that idea to your subject? So what you have to learn to do is you have to actually learn to listen to the things that come out of your mouth. And look, I'm type A. I talk fast. That can be a challenge sometimes. I get it. But that's one of those things you have to practice. Sorry, there's no you know five-point list and then you're a pro. No. Requires some practice. Be the subject. Because the idea of be the subject, it solves so many problems when it comes to communicating and directing and working with models. Because number one, if you are really putting effort into, and, and the, the word behind all this, the underlying word, is, is empathy. It's considering what impact are your words having. Number one, simply is this person going to understand them. Number two, are you asking to do, this person to do something that they are potentially uncomfortable with. Number three, are you by chance being inappropriate? Maybe it's not inappropriate for you in your mind, but is it inappropriate to them in their mind? Like it or not, folks, that is a very real concern and should be a priority for every photographer working, photographing people today. So be the subject have empathy, put yourself in your subject's shoes. That's step one. Just by doing that, I find, and I have learned over the years, that forces me to be more descriptive, to offer more information. 
flip side of that, I'll go ahead and I'll make myself the butt of a joke. One of my horrible habits as a husband. I've been with my wife for just over 20 years now. I frequently expect her to simply read my mind. It's not really fair. She would say probably a lot more than that, but that's the gist. I'll summarize, okay? You can't expect your subjects to read your mind. You have to give them lots of information. You have to be more descriptive. You have to be more detailed. By doing that, you are going to start shooting with your subject giving you much closer to what it is that you're imagining in your head, okay? So, you know, those types of things, super, super important, okay? Don't assume, we all know what happens when you assume, don't assume that your subject is going to understand a simple direction. And, and especially, guys, look, especially uh, you guys that are my age and older, yeah, I'm picking on middle-aged guys here, especially middle-aged white guys. That's who I'm picking on right now, okay? We're like the worst offenders as a category. I'm proud that I'm not, but but fact is, as a category, we are the worst offenders. I see it every place I go and teach, every workshop I ever do, every demo I ever do. We just think that people are going to get it. So we tend to talk industry speak, photographer speak. Your subject is not responsible for knowing that. Even if you're working with a model, you know what? Even if you're working with a professional model from a modeling agency, it is not his or her responsibility to know your speak. Also understand that when you're just giving short directions or, you know, you're doing your little mumble thing while you're looking at the camera, once again, be the model. So what is your subject experiencing at that point? They're experiencing some grumpy dude like puts him with his camera, not really paying attention to them. And then finally saying, oh yeah, you know, give me, give me, give me happy. And then there's a camera shoved in your face. Like that's not collaboration, right? Photographing people in any way, shape or form, even for a street photographer, photographing people is a relationship game. You have to be willing to interact with people. Otherwise, you're simply shooting the wrong genre, right? You need to go look into product work or landscape photography or wildlife or something like that. And I hate to tell you, even wildlife requires a lot of psychology. It's just that it's animal psychology. So you also have to realize, and this is leading closer to the mistake that I made, you also have to realize that what makes sense to you doesn't necessarily make sense to your subject. So it's about making a connection on their terms, right? It is not reasonable as a photographer to expect your subject to kind of raise to your level of language or knowledge. It is your job to bring yourself down to them and speak at their level. Speaking down to somebody doesn't help. Talk to any photographer who shoots kids and shoots children and listen to them and watch them. They get down on the kid's level and they treat that kid like an adult. Part of the reason they do that, simple psychology. By getting down on the kid's level, they're not looking down, they're not towering over the kid, they're not intimidating the kid. By treating that kid with the same respect that that kid sees adults treat each other, they instantly earn that kid's trust and respect and friendship. And then they can get the kid to do whatever they want. But there's another thing that child and kid photographers do. So I'm going to use them as the example for this. This is a great example. They make sure that when they're photographing those kids and they're down on the ground with those kids at their level, they give the kid the same energy that they want back from the kid. So they're not like sitting on their knees or sitting on their butt or laying down on the ground and being like, okay, now I need you to go over there and I want you to sit on that box. And when you sit on that box, put your hands really nicely on your knees, sit up really straight. They're not doing that. First of all, they're going to put in some work. They're not going to lay down, sit down or any of that kind of stuff. 
They're going to get off their butt. They're going to take the kid's hand and they're going to say, hey, come on, let's go over here and sit in this box because we can do something really cool. And now when you're in the box, awesome. I want you to sit right there. It's going to take me a second. Let me get back there. And they're going to crawl back over there and they're going to pick up their camera and they're going to make jokes and they're going to talk to the kid. And you notice what I did at the same time. I brought my energy level up. I acted excited about what I'm doing. So if you're going to photograph people, in addition to be the subject, I keep doing that. I, I literally want you to think of you know, almost like a meditative thing. It's like be the subject, feel it, imagine it, put yourself in their shoes, right? But understand, and it's completely psychology, gang. It's psychology. We tend to give what we get back. So you've got to give the energy or the emotion that you want from your subject, period. If you want your subject happy and energetic, you got to be happy and energetic and you should be smiling while you're talking. That's exciting. You want them to be excited. If you're looking for something serious or maybe you're photographing a CEO of a company, you just want it to be calm and confident, you should slow your speech down and say, okay, so now, you know, let's go ahead and let's try one with your arms folded so that we have kind of that power pose. Power is a word CEOs like. Good. That's it. I want you to look very distinguished. This is going to be great. Boom. You're going to bring your language and your tone and your pacing to match the emotion and the tone and the energy that you want back from your subject. Super, super important. And gang, I hate to tell you, it works every time, right? And I can't tell you how many old man photographers I've dealt with in my lifetime that are like, well, look, that's, that's just not me. Okay. You know, when I was younger, they were all guys that had white beards. They're still guys that have white beards, but it's not just guys that have white beards. Sorry. Okay. But it's like, well, that's not me. That, that's not my style. That's not who I am. Well, nobody gives a damn about who you are. Just like they don't give a damn about your photography. You're the only person that cares about your photography. They care about the experience that you are providing to them, right? So you know that going in, like that's not bad. It doesn't make you bad. It doesn't make them bad. That's just understanding. Hey, look, this, this is what it comes down to. So if there's something that you want, you've got to work to get it. Now, at the same time, and this is one that I joke about a lot, but my God, I actually saw somebody uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to name any names. I was at an event in North Carolina. We were doing shootouts. And I saw this more than once while I was there, while people were photographing the models. Because what happens in a situation like that, and this is, this is nothing bad towards the attendees that were, that were you know, at this event. But when you have events like that at trade shows and things like that, where you know, there's large groups of, of people, photographers learning, the models kind of become the equivalent of like animals behind bars in a zoo. Right, people will come up in droves because there's lighting and the models have cool outfits and they have makeup and everybody like stands around and takes pictures or maybe they wait their turn. Which the group in North Carolina was actually awesome at taking turns, not interfering with the photographer that was shooting. Everybody would stand back and watch. But the fact of the matter is, you know, poor models standing there. Many times, you know, some of these models were teenagers, like 18 years old, and you know, there's like 20 people standing watching while one person's taking pictures. That's like that's tough for them, right? So you got to realize that in situations like that, your subjects are putting themselves in a vulnerable position. You have the ability to make them look amazing. You have the ability to make them look like crap. But one of the things, and this is what I saw happen a couple of times, and believe me, it happens much, much more than it should. Photographer would walk up. They were all very polite. They would introduce themselves to the model and say hi. And I was actually really excited to see photographers doing that without me having to kind of bully the photographers to make sure they did it. Super polite people. It's that Southern hospitality, right? They would come up, they would introduce themselves to the model, say a few little words. They take a test shot, but inevitably there's a few people then that would do that test shot, look at the camera and be like, oh crap. Standing like three feet, four feet in front of the model, right? So obviously the minute your subject hears that, oh crap, you've just made that session a thousand times harder. Now, 
in a session like a trade show session, you know, at those kind of events, the girls get used to that really, really quick because people just kind of forget that, like, yeah, that's a human being right there and it's my subject. But when you're working one on one with a model or a portrait subject or a bride, whatever, that's like the worst thing you could possibly do is be like, oh, crap. That's one of those scenarios where you got to fake it. You, you absolutely got to fake it. And remind me, because you know me, I'll get sidetracked. If you bring that up again, I will give you a cool little trick for that situation. But I want to move forward right now. Okay. So the other thing is you should always be considering your subject's comfort level when you're shooting. Now, what I mean by that is I'm not, I'm, I'm, we're not into like, you know, boudoir and that kind of stuff yet. No, no, no. I mean, is it really cold? Is it really hot? Have you guys been shooting for six hours and they haven't had lunch? Have you been shooting for four hours and you notice they've had nothing to drink? Whatever. Okay. Keep your subjects comfortable. Keep your subjects fed. Keep your subjects hydrated. Super, super important. If you are putting your subject in a situation where they're having to work extra time, where they're going longer without food, where they're working, you know, um, in fact, it's August right now. For the last month, a lot of commercial companies like the Targets of the world, the Walmarts of the world, they've been out shooting their winter clothing ads in the summertime. So there's a group of models that, of course, were sweating like crazy having to look cold, okay? So, you know, whatever the extreme is, whether it's a big extreme or a small extreme, make sure that you are keeping your subject's comfort in mind. Sometimes they're gonna have to suck it up a little bit, but you're going to acknowledge, just acknowledging to them that you know they're going above and beyond. Just acknowledging that you know it's a tough situation goes a long way, right? So, um, by the way, let me just reaffirm one thing. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I mentioned about the don't do the oh crap thing. You never want your subject to feel that you are unhappy with what's happening. So there's another piece to this, right? So oh crap means in all likelihood you screwed up, but to them, they don't know what you're saying oh crap about when you look at that LCD. You could be saying oh crap about their hair, their makeup, their outfit. You could be saying, oh crap, like, oh, yeah, they're not quite as photogenic as I thought they would be. They don't know. So if you ever catch, excuse me, if you catch yourself and make that mistake, you better come up with some confidence right away, right? So let's just say that, you know, your exposure was off. Because for me, like if it's an oh crap, it's usually going to be, I don't know what I was thinking, but man, that light's way too hot. So if I let that oh crap rip, I better come right back then and say, oh, hey, don't worry. This is actually looking really cool. I just have this light too powerful. I need to turn it down. Okay, cool, right? So you've acknowledged kind of, eh, I probably shouldn't have said that. You don't have to say, oh, I shouldn't have said that. But you've acknowledged like, oh, that might have you know, caused concern. You've reassured them, hey, no problem. Got it under control, right? So let me tell you the piece that I just made a mistake with. Uh, and it was, it was something that I was beating. I spent the day beating myself up over this. I was so irritated at myself, mainly because for the last probably five or six years, I find myself at workshops and trade shows and events, picking on other photographers for doing it, kind of poking fun at them a little bit to make them aware of just how much they had not thought about what they said. So, um, the photograph that I did, in fact, here, it's, um, uh, it's on Instagram. So let me switch my screen over. Okay. The, the shot that I posted this week on Instagram, this was from Carolina photo expo. Okay. This young lady who is just absolutely gorgeous. I, I loved working with her. I was very fortunate to work with a couple amazing models while I was at Carolina photo expo. And I do have some more images that will get posted over the next couple of days. This young lady is only 18 years old. Okay. So, um, they had her hair up. I mean, this is the way they kind of brought her out to the trade show. I had not photographed her previous to, to this scenario. This was actually one of the last shots I did of her, but, um, I had not even met her prior to 
the uh, trade show demo that I did. They brought her out and I started photographing. So when we got to the end, I had walked back to, after the, the demo was done, I had walked back to the room where they had the models and the makeup artists and the hairstylists and, and all kind of stuff just to check in with um, my model for that evening and to check in with the makeup artist. And she was there and we were talking a little bit. Her mother had come to the event with her. Which, you know, she's young. She's 18 years old. That's cool. And I got all excited about this hairstyle and this look. And I said to her, I said, you know, I would love to do an Audrey Hepburn look with you. Now, this young girl sitting in a chair, I was standing up. I was just, she, it's where she was when I walked in the room. I'm looking down at her. Mom is next to her. And I just ripped out this, you know, I'd love to do an Audrey Hepburn look with you. And literally as soon as the name crossed my lips, I realized I'll bet this girl has no clue whatsoever who Audrey Hepburn is. And sure enough, she just kind of gave me a dead stare because literally as soon as I said, I started laughing. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. You don't know who that is, do you? And at this point I was, I was so angry at myself and she's like, no, I have no idea. And I just kind of laughed and, and you know, the makeup artist and the hairstylist, they were in the room. They were old enough to know. One of the models was old enough to know. Um, Mom is laughing and I just kind of like turned around and walked out with my head in shame. And on the way out, I said, ask your mom, she'll explain. But the reason why I tell you this story is it's honestly, it's the first time that I've run into it. So it was kind of one of those, oh my God, I'm feeling old moments, but it highlights a really, really important piece of the communication part, right? generationally, there will always be different references, right? If you were to say, which you should not be using this as a, as a direction, but if you did, if you were to say, give me something sexy to a 40-year-old, it's going to mean different than a 30-year-old. It's going to mean different than a 20-year-old. And if there's enough of an age gap in between for that 20 year old, it's creepy. So it's really, really important. And this is more work, gang. Yes, I'm dumping more work on your shoulders. But if you want great images, if you want images with people where the expressions are meaningful and they're engaging and they force people to stop and look at your photography, you yourself have to make that same kind of connection. So understand it's not the camera that's making the connection. Now, you guys know I'm all about eyes, right? My photography, it's all about eyes. Just like you see in this shot, it's very common for me that I'm going to have my model staring straight down the barrel of my lens because that right there, guys, that's, that's every man's fantasy. That's a connection with a beautiful woman. That's why I tend to do it. I love that connection because when somebody looks at that picture, they are forced to engage with that subject. But in order to make it work, it's not enough for the subject to just be pretty or beautiful. <laughs> Heinz, Heinz Santos types in, we are old, dude. I'm going to pretend, I'm going to give you one pass. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that because otherwise I just have to ban you. I am not old. I refuse to be old. Um, I'm kidding. But so to make that connection, you do have to pay attention. But now there's a flip side to that. The flip side is don't try to be cool. Don't try to be young, right? They're looking at you. They can see the age difference, right? Depending on how fast you move, depending on how much energy you bring to the shoot, they can feel the age difference right? So it's not about being an old guy who, you know, knows everything that an 18 year old knows and can talk like an 18 year old. No, because you're just going to look cheesy and making it cheesy is going to make it uncomfortable and creepy, right? It simply means find other ways. Literally after I walked out and beat myself up for five minutes, the light bulb went on in my head and I was like, you're such an idiot. I walked back in the room and pulled out my phone, went to Google 
and typed in Audrey Hepburn and clicked on the images tab. And then I was able to say to her, you know, this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking about, right? And then also, just to give you a sense of how, you know, great, since most of you know who Audrey Hepburn is, here, let me switch one more time. Here's another, whoops, I'm gonna try and get myself out of this frame here, guys. Hang on one second. Um, this is another shot of her, can I turn, whoops, there it is, okay. So that's another shot of her, and you can obviously, you can see the Audrey Hepburn references, even with her profile, um, you know, and there's the full, full version of that, okay? So I went back and I pulled out my phone and I showed her a couple images of Audrey Hepburn and she, you know, was immediately like, oh my God, like, yeah, that's really cool, that'd be neat, et cetera, boom. So there's always ways to do it, but you gotta be putting some thought into it. You have to be making that connection, okay? A um, Couple other quick tips, and then we're gonna move on for tonight. Um, and really, that's the big key. That is the biggest key. So there's a whole nother discussion to be had, which I am in the process of lining up two models that we're going to talk to, uh, because there's the whole other discussion. I started out talking about how the world's evolved and how things that you used to be able to say, you can't say now. And I want to be really clear before anybody starts typing anything that's going to like not be politically correct. The fact that there are things that are inappropriate for us to say now that we might have said 10 years ago, that's actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But indeed, even for people like myself, that has required some learning and some evolving. Evolution is not a bad thing. Let's be really, really clear. Because at the, at the underlying piece of that conversation, it's all about respect. It's simply about respect. So we are going to have a conversation with that so that we can be more specific, but it's not right for me to have that conversation. I want to have that conversation with two models so that we can also hear from the people on the receiving end of these comments and these words, because that's the appropriate way to do it. It's not up to me to represent that. It would be inappropriate for me to do that. So what I want you to take away from tonight is if you're photographing people, and you need to give directions. Because I frequently hear people all the time say, well, you know what? I just, I just don't know the right words. It's a human being. You don't have to know the right words. What you do have to do is you have to have an opinion or an idea. What you do have to do is be sincere. What you do have to do is you have to show some empathy. In other words, Put yourself in that person's shoes. If you were asked to do what you're asking of them, how would that likely make you feel? What would be the challenges that you would incur to do it? Factor all of those things in, and it simply becomes about a conversation between two people. And then the last important piece is, remember, you get what you give. If you want a lot of energy and you want it to be happy, give energy and make it happy. If you want it serious, if you want it sexy, give it a little attitude, choose your words carefully, but slow things down and give it the right tone and the right mood, okay? So Sean had a comment in here that's, that's worth mentioning because it, it parallels. It's actually not a piece of this, but it parallels it, Sean. Um, that's what I try to do, have some photos on my phone of the ideas I had for the photo shoot because at times I suck at explaining my ideas. So now, Sean, I'm going to agree with what you're saying and say, that's awesome, but I'm going to push you to go a step further, okay? The, at times I suck at explaining my ideas. I guarantee you, even those of us that are confident with explaining our ideas, we've been there and we'll be there again. It happens, right? So one of the ways that you get through this process and you get through this process very effectively is even when you don't have the right words, if you have to pause for a second and think, if you have to maybe find another picture to kind of add to the first picture to kind of put the pieces together, because believe me, I've done that. You do whatever it takes and you give it your best shot. Because here's the thing, it's better to give your subject 
some kind of information, some kind of direction coming from a sincere place. And be honest, guys and ladies. Sorry, I shouldn't say guys because it's photographers. Be honest. If you're just not sure, say to the subject, believe me, I do this all the time. It's like, you know what? I'm not sure if this is exactly what I'm after, but here's my idea. And I'm thinking if we try this or if you think about that, we're going to come up with what we want. But I, I need to see it. So let's give this a shot. By doing that, I'm still giving them a lot of information. I'm being really honest. I'm not sure if it's going to work. Which what that also does is that says to them, hey, this might be a little bit outside the box. This might be a little bit awkward, but, but try it with me. Okay? By thinking out loud, by talking out loud, by admitting when you're maybe like really, really excited because you know this is it or you're just not sure about something, you are bringing your subject into the collaborative process. I talked in the beginning about photographers that tend to treat their subjects like objects. We don't collaborate with objects. And so many photographers don't. So many photographers, they work with a model. They set up some lights. They set up a background. They say to the model, stand there. And they step back. They pick up their camera and they say, okay, go do your thing. I'm sorry. If you're one of those photographers, you deserve for your pictures to suck. And I guarantee you, your pictures probably do. I know some of you hate me for saying that. But you know what? You don't get great stuff that way. Every now and then, you might get lucky. Every now and then, you might get something. But the fact of the matter is, even the best posing models in the world, they don't know what they look like. MIB Pro 3030, I think you've brought this question up every time for the last three weeks. If this person is not able to make comments, it's for one of two reasons. Either they have done something inappropriate in the past or they're not a subscriber. But do you think we can get through a whole week without having to stress out about why somebody can't put a comment in? Could we, could we do that? Okay. Because I'm glad that this message is so important to you that, you know, you're worried about somebody being able to make a comment. If they have been banned for some reason and they want to get back in here, they need to man up, go to my website, send me a message and let's deal with it. Right? Real simple. But you know, I don't take crap in, in my classroom. It's my classroom. So that being said, I want to answer questions for you tonight. I want to do a little bit of a q and I asked a question in the poll that's up at the top. If you have not answered it, interesting, 21% of you say that you know what all three of those things is. See, now's when I wish that I had names. Don't worry, I don't. I don't, I don't have any access to who gave what answer. Um, because I'm actually pretty sure that 21% of you don't actually know what those three things are. But I will take your word at it. And that's, that's cool. Um, you're going to have to trust me a little bit. I have a reason for asking this. And I am going to be talking a lot about this beginning in two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, next week, I pro made a promise last, last week. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, marketing for photographers. Kind of a uh, 2021 update, but I do want you guys to start thinking about specific questions, challenges, problems you have, because I'm going to ask for that at the very beginning of the show next week. And I really want to personalize that for the people that are going to show out because marketing, you know, marketing live streams always bring small crowds and that's cool. I get it. That's fine. So if you're going to be there, I want to make sure that I'm helping you. So I'm not going to prepare some big curriculum, right? But this conversation about uh, watch seconds, lumens, and, and lux, and as I mentioned earlier, I should have added guide number in there. Um, it's something that um, is becoming a big priority for me. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, who is, who is Seraphin actually made a comment at the beginning. And, and I, Seraphin, I want to bring this up not to make fun of you, but to actually tell you you're really pretty normal. Uh, I said, 17 years in photography, and I've never, ever heard of either one. I'm a bit ashamed, but I've never done the kind of photography that you do. So here's the interesting thing, Seraphim. Uh, number one, it doesn't matter what kind of photography you do. If you use any kind of lighting at all, those three words, watt seconds, lumens, and lux, probably impact most, if not all, of your 
lighted photography, right? Um, meaning if you're using strobes or if you're using um, any kind of constant lighting, it impacts your photography. Don't feel bad that you don't know really what they are or how they work because the fact of the matter is, is you're all seeing almost 80% of you don't understand those things. But yet I am confident, maybe not 80%, but a lot more than 50% of you own at least one light, right? So the point is, if you own at least one light and you don't know what those three things are, there was a disconnect somewhere because those three things are the things that we use to judge how powerful a light is. And I know a bunch of you are going to say, well, I, I know, I know what watt seconds is, right? Cause like I have a Godox 8400 and it's 400 watt seconds, but here's the interesting thing about it, gang. And, and I'm guilty of purveying this because conversationally, this is what we've used in the photography world. 400 watt seconds does not tell you how powerful your flash is. 600 watt seconds does not tell you how powerful your flash is. 200 watt seconds does not tell you how powerful your flash is. We could go out and we could buy a 600 watt second flash from four different companies. We could get an Elon Chrome, we could get a Pro Photo, we can get a Godox, we can get a whatever, an Alien B or a Pulsey Buff, doesn't matter, okay? And line them all up in a row, set them all to full power, 600 watt seconds, and take a picture, and the exposure will vary between the three. It will not be identical. That's a fact. Watt seconds is simply the capacity of the capacitor. It's how much wattage is the capacitor in the unit able to generate on demand. On demand meaning when you take a picture, the flash, right? So it's not really a good way to compare them because you could take two different brands, set them side by side. They can both be 200, 400, 600 watt seconds, and they're not going to give you the same exposure. So how do we actually compare that? Think about that. So I'll give you the short answer now, lumens and lux. These are the numbers that you're going to start seeing a lot more of as we get more and more and more LED lights, right? And you've actually seen me talk about them in some of my videos where I've talked about LEDs. If you go back a couple of years, I did a whole five-part series on LEDs compared to strobes. And I talked about lumens, lux. So lumens is the light output of a light, right? That's that's the like kind of the modern version of when we used to buy bulbs, we bought a 100-watt bulb, a 60-watt bulb, an 80-watt bulb, a 25-watt bulb, et cetera. Well, that's really not effective for LEDs because LEDs are more directional. So lumens is the amount of energy that the light is, is putting out. But, but here's the problem, right? You could have, let's say, uh, a thousand lumens. You could have three lights with thousand lumens and also have three different exposures between the three lights, depending upon the type of bulb, depending upon the type of modification that's on the front of it, if there's any kind of a lens or diffuser on the front, and depending really on the placement of that LED chip in the casing. So lumens is not actually super effective. Probably the most effective of the three for measuring any light source, flash or LED, is lux. But the problem with Lux is, Lux measures light from the light source. So lumen is output, Lux is the light received at, at the source, at, excuse me, not at the source. Can't believe I said that. It's the light received at the subject. But it's a cumulative amount of light over a one meter area. And now I know a lot of you just raised an eyebrow like cumulative amount of light over one meter. What the hell is he talking about? You're right. So my argument is, and guide numbers, we won't even get started on guide numbers because basically guide numbers, every flash manufacturer that does speed lights and tells you the guide number of the flash, that's a joke because you can manipulate the guide number based upon the distance, based upon the ISO, and based upon the zoom setting. So they will almost always zoom the flash to 200 millimeter or whatever its, its most powerful setting is, and they'll report that guide number because that's going to be the brightest. And they'll report it at like three feet. Well, 
how many situations are you actually going to use a flash zoomed to 200 millimeter at three feet from your subject? So it's, it's a pointless measurement, right? You can't compare one flash to the next if they're all using different variations of the equation. So this is a real thing in the industry, gang. You should pay more attention to this. It's a problem. So anyway, it's a new mission of mine. I have an idea for how we can standardize all this. Now, I want to be clear. Watt seconds, lumens, lux will never go away because they're part of physics, right? So, so they're part of the manufacturing process, the back end of these units. But the way we as photographers compare them, there's an easier way. There's an easier way by which we can compare strobes against LEDs, LEDs against other LEDs. So we're going to talk about that. So I appreciate all of you participating in that poll because we're going to dig more into that in two weeks. I'm going to have some information for you there. Okay. All right. So um, questions, start posting some comments that I have here. Uh, and also I saw one or two questions go by uh, with modern cameras and lenses. You can, and again, I, I apologize. I don't know what the pronunciation of that name is. Um, with modern cameras and lenses, um, you can shoot at night without light. I started researching artificial light only when I wanted to learn studio shoots uh, or enhanced night shoots um, with slight touches. Well, yeah, I mean, part of why it's time, uh, this is in the world according to Joe, but I'm willing to bet, okay, that you will all agree when I'm done with this explanation. Alvaro, you're correct. If you want to do the math, I shouldn't have to do the math. As a consumer, I shouldn't have to, right? Think about it. But you're absolutely correct in your statement here. He says, you can easily convert the guide number to leave everyone with the same ISO and zoom. Right. That's basically if you redo the equation so that you have, you know, everything at the same zoom setting with a flash set at the same power, at the same distance, at the same ISO, you can come up with, you know, a universal standard between all the speed lights. Studio strobes don't use guide numbers. LEDs don't use guide numbers, right? And I shouldn't have to do that. So this is where this is coming from, just so you guys know, right? As Because I'm like most of you, the 79% that answered that you don't really know what those terms are all about, I'm just like you. Until five years ago, I didn't know what Lux and Lumens was. And even then, I had a much more basic understanding of it than I do now. Because of a project that I'm working on, I'm much, much deeper into it at this point. And that's why I'm so much more frustrated. Because literally, I can go from one manufacturer to the next online. And I'm not, I'm not picking on any one company. They all do it. They all do it, gang. We go from one company to the next. And you are not going to find the same set of standards used for the measurements. So when you're reading the marketing information, you do not actually know how powerful that light really is. You have a ballpark idea, but you don't actually know. Which indeed is part of the reason why so many photographers get this mentality. Oh, I want to overpower the sun. Give me that 600 watt seconds. Which you've heard me say many, many times is overkill, not necessary. And it's kind of ridiculous, right? So um, again, I do, I, I have a solution. I really, really do. It's a solution that I feel really good about. We're going to talk about it in two weeks. I'm going to break it all down. So for those of you that don't know what that stuff is, I'm going to give you super simple, super easy to understand explanations so that you will walk away from um, that episode, understanding watt seconds, understanding lux and lumens. But then I'm also going to give you my solution. But the only way the solution happens, gang, I'll tell you right now, the only way the solution happens is if you agree with me when you hear it, it's up to us as consumers to let the manufacturers know that we want to see this information. So it's not like Joe's got an idea and the whole industry is going to snap their fingers. It's not going to be that easy. But I think you'll like my idea. I really, really do. So we'll test it out. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Mr. Elman, I don't know if you have answered this question already, but how do you get a non-professional model to give a certain expression during a photo shoot? I enjoy your classes. So uh, there's a couple things. First of all, it's a great question. Um, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Every model that you see on my website, every single one with the exception, I think of two, just two. The pictures that you're seeing are from like their first or second photo shoot ever. 
So they are either not models, just attractive people, or they are beginner models because that's what I used to do. I used to shoot modeling portfolios, right? So just to make the point that it's doable, gang, okay? So when I hear non-model, the only reason I'm picking on that, and I understand your question, I'm going to give you some ideas here, but the, the reason why I'm picking on that is frequently photographers will tend to automatically kind of mentally put their subject in a box of lesser abilities because, well, well, they've never really modeled before. I hate to tell you, gang, let me, not to burst your bubble, and this is going to get me in trouble, but it's the truth. I swear to you, I've got tons of experience for this. Don't think that just because you get a model from a modeling agency that that model is going to be able to just do whatever you want, however you want it, and be amazing. Don't think you can put that model in front of the camera and say, go, and it's going to be the coolest photo shoot that you've ever had in your life. You will be seriously disappointed. Modeling agencies put very little effort into training and developing their models. That's a fact. Now, are there some that do? Yeah, there's a few. But overwhelmingly, they do not. Overwhelmingly, they find pretty faces that have gone to the trouble of putting together a portfolio and they send them out for jobs. With the idea that, okay, well, they got all these really good pictures, so they can handle it. Boom, out the door. That's what happens, gang. So that's why you always hear me tell you, don't spend the money on a modeling agency model. It's not going to make a difference in your photography. Find the subject that fits your idea. That's who you want to work with, right? So, but going back to the question, how do you get a non-professional model to give a certain expression? All the things that I've talked about before. One, you have to describe in detail. What am I looking for? What am I trying to achieve? Two, you have to show that energy. You have to give that same kind of energy that you want back. That's why I started with be the model. If you understand, you personally, what it takes to create that expression or that emotion, if you were in front of the camera, then you're giving directions based on experience that you've had. So really what you're doing is you're sharing your own knowledge and then you are helping that person get what you need, okay? So that's, that's how I would approach that. Bottom line, it takes some practice. If you're looking for a say this or do this, it's not how it works. It's just not how it works. And trust me, there's YouTube videos out there that are gonna give you five tips to make you the most amazing poser or whatever ever. Go watch those videos. You're still not gonna be able to do it. You're not gonna be able to do it until you practice it. You won't be able to do it until you learn to put yourself in your subject's shoes, show empathy, and make your subject a collaborator. One of the ideas that you heard before about uh, having pictures, you could do the same with expressions, right? So you can find images of the expressions that you're after, and you can show those to the subject. But here's the thing. Don't, trust me, please don't do this. Don't find a picture of a facial expression and show that to your subject and say, hey, I, I want this expression. Worst idea ever. Worst idea. Because now you've just challenged your subject to say, here, do this. If your subject, let's just say that the model that's in the picture that you found is gorgeous. And the subject that's in front of you is gorgeous. But like many people today, doesn't really think they're that gorgeous. So now... They're intimidated by how beautiful that person is and think, I can't look that pretty. That's what's in their head. They may not say it, but they can't look that pretty. And then they're just seeing a facial expression. Seeing a facial expression, it's not like they're looking in a mirror. They're looking at a picture. It's very hard to replicate it without some idea about the emotion. So if you are going to show them a picture of a facial expression, that's not a horrible idea, provided that you add descriptions. What is it that that expression means to you? What are you trying to get from it? The whole idea of showing pictures, you have to understand that you are comparing your subject to somebody. Whether you intend to or not, it doesn't matter. That's how people process it in their minds, right? So you have to be really, really careful with how much of that you do. It's really, you're much better off to just, again, have an open, honest discussion. 
Gang, one of the things that helps a lot when you are communicating with people as subjects, right? Now I get it. I have a lot more experience with this, right? But I only got the experience because I was willing to fail. So even when I come on here and I talk to you guys every week, those of you that are regulars, there have been weeks where I've started the show with my microphone turned off and I'm talking away and I'm going crazy. You guys can't hear a thing. And I look like a moron. And so I finally see the messages. Oh, no audio. And I start over and I fix it. There are plenty of times, just like tonight, I talked about something that I said to a young lady that just like bombed the second I said it. I'm not afraid to acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I'm not great. But I have a lot of experience, good and bad, right? So too often, one of the ways that we tend to protect ourselves in front of subjects is we feel like we've got to be like top dog, you know, got to be hot shit, okay? I've got to be perfect. I've got to be this amazing, you know, this, that, whatever. The first time I walked on a stage for Olympus, I was scared out of my mind. There were all, because I'd never shot in front of people. Never. I had avoided it my entire career. It's five years ago. Nashville, Tennessee. Imaging USA. Scott Kelby. Scott Kelby sitting in the front row. I walk on a stage, scared to death. I've never shot in front of other people. All the technology for the, the stage was messed up that day. They couldn't get my camera to connect to the tether to show up on the big screens. So they handed me Tracy McGlasky's camera right before I went on stage and said, here, use this. For those of you that are Olympus shooters, you understand right away where that problem lies. Olympus shooters, we customize our cameras like crazy. I was fairly new to Olympus and they handed me Tracy's camera and it was customized for her. And I'm walking onto the stage as they give me this camera. I was panicked. So I made a decision in that moment and it was the greatest thing. It was actually the most freeing thing ever. I made a decision. All right, Joe, you're going to be standing on that stage and you're not going to get everything right because you have no idea where the settings are. For Tracy, you're going to have to change things on the fly because the camera's not going to do all the things you want it to do. So the best thing you can do is show people sincerely. How do you solve problems? What happens when it doesn't work? What do you do? And that's what I did. Scott Kelby was live tweeting about it while it happened. I got some really cool pictures. People loved it. And when I came off, people actually thanked me for not just doing razzle-dazzle on the stage, but actually showing that mistakes happen. We all make mistakes. Everybody does. It's part of the process. And when you do, you got to solve the problem, right? So part of the thing that, that I find that, that kind of handicaps so many photographers is they think that they've got to appear perfect in front of their subject. They think that they've got to kind of put on this air of like, oh my God, uh, I'm amazing, right? And, and no, you don't have to be. You're a creative person just like them. You're working with them to try and create something that you're both is, you know, going to think is really, really cool. Okay. That's the key. So Sean Crane, I did that oh crap moment after um, taking a photo of a cosplayer at a comic convention. Uh, I told her it was not anything she did. Yeah, you know what? We've all made that mistake. I joke about the oh crap thing because I've done it. Now, I will say at this point, this is how mean I am. If I know the model and I've worked with a model a bunch of times, like when I work with Monet, you know, my makeup artist who's in a lot of my images, I'll frequently do a test shot and be like, man, that looks like crap. I do it on purpose, right? Just to tease her. That's different, okay? Because um, at this point, you know, she knows better. She's also heard me give the lecture about don't say oh crap. So, um, Hein Santos, thank you so much for the super chat. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, so yeah, Sean, I would, I would suggest that you did exactly the right thing. I mean, you know, we all slip up sometimes. It kind of comes out and, and remember gang, you don't necessarily have to say, oh crap. If, if you let them see it in your body language or your facial expression, it's just as bad, right? So, uh, you don't want that to happen. Okay. And when you do just apologize for it and explain super simple. Uh, Alvaro, the problem that I've seen in many photographers is that they do not have a clear idea of what they're looking at, which makes them frustrated, get nervous, and even aggressive. Yes. And, you know, that's actually a, a great analogy there, uh, Alvaro, is that, you know, that's an unprepared photographer, right? That's, that's the problem. Um, that happens for a couple of reasons. You know, when I talk about all these things to make it better, 
The problem that some photographers have, and I'm, I'm not putting anybody down, I'm, but I'm keeping it real. The problem that some photographers have when they hear all this stuff is like, man, I don't want to do that much work. That's, 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 that's not what I'm into for photography. That's not what I want. You know, it's, it's no different than there are some photographers that love their gear. They're all about their gear. They talk about their gear. They buy more gear than they need. They'll debate more gear. They'll argue about gear. It's kind of like, you know, with cars, right? There's motorheads and there's people like me that want a car with great gas mileage. It's going to get me from point A to point B and it's not going to break the bank, right? So it's the same with photography. And so when we get into this process, you know, part of it is, is these photographers that don't want to put in the energy and put in the effort. What it comes down to at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to progress beyond a certain point. They are always basically going to be victims of their own shortcuts and their own laziness. That's kind of the challenge there, right? So um, I completely agree with your, you know, your observations. So um, any camera works here. Whoops, let me get that on the screen. James, love the show. Just brought some studio lights to take photos of my daughters uh, and for product photography. Cool. So here's my advice, James, since you used the plural of the word studio lights. If you've never done lighting, so this is a big if, but this is a lesson for the rest of you too. If you've never done lighting and you're just getting started, if you have more than one light, James, put them away in a closet. Just keep out one. No modifiers, no umbrellas, no softboxes, just one. So you need a light stand, you need light, and you need a trigger. And then practice. Practice with that one light and master creating good light with one light. You can do that. You know, for some reason we teach photographers, oh, direct flash is crap light. No, direct flash is only crap light when you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Because I hate to tell you when you go out and you shoot in the sun, that's direct light. And yet we do tons of shooting in the sun, right? So learn how to master one light. Once you've mastered one light with no modifier, then start working with one light and a reflector. Still no modifier, just a reflector. Master that. Then once you've mastered that, then add an umbrella or softbox, whichever you have, and master that. Once you've gotten to the point where you've gone through those steps and you've mastered them, in other words, you can consistently pick up your camera, set up your lights, take a picture, and it's going to be of decent quality. Once you've done that, then you add one more light. So even if you have four lights, you're going to add them one at a time. I promise you by doing that, you will learn lighting faster. You will be able to see the nuances between the light. Because if you just get out all four of them and start playing with them or three of them, whatever you have, or two of them, whatever you have, you're making the task 10 times harder. I promise you. Okay. From Dwayne here. Uh, let's see. Can you please help um, tell me your favorite modifier again? You did a show a month or so ago, but I forgot. Um, and I want the umbrella. Oh, uh, if we're talking about the umbrella, it's the Westcott. Um, it's a 32 inch, I think, 31 or 32 inch shoot through uh, umbrella from um, Westcott. That's um, inexpensive. It's, I used to, I've always said it's less than 20 bucks. I think it's like $21 now, inflation, right? But still, um, it's probably the lowest priced modifier that Westcott sells. Westcott's a little pricey, um, but. Yeah, um, it's the, the the Westcott modifier. That's what you're seeing actually behind me, okay? Uh, let's see here. And some other comments. Hein Santos, it's always been really funny when I get asked if I know how to use flashlighting or ambient light. Light is light, just a different source. I completely agree, but you'd be amazed how many people do not approach it that way. So super, super important. Um, let's see here. And I think I've got everything back up here. Um, I got that. And then there was one more thing coming in here. Uh, let's see. Fun thing about your one light direction here. Most studios come with three lights and all modifiers included. Uh, you have to learn the hard way because not using at least, uh, two when they're included is a bummer. Uh, yeah. And, and believe me, that happens, that happens here in the U S. Uh, I know for a fact that happens even in the UK because I've been in rental studios in the UK um, yeah, same thing. I mean, cause you kind of expect that, right? It's like, well, I want to be able to do this, this, and this, so they're going to have the lights. But if you're just going in and you're brand new and you don't know what you're doing, uh, yeah, one, one light is totally the way to go. Believe me. Okay. All right. Last question here. Uh, cause as usual, I'm over time. 
from Lane, have I ever worked with anyone in a wheelchair? I have. Um, I have been doing some casual wheelchair shoots for people and getting some great smiles. Uh, yeah, I mean, if smiles are what you want, that's cool. Um, you know, really working with a person in a wheelchair is no different than working with a person that's sitting or standing for that matter, other than the sense that, you know, most importantly, when you're photographing people, gang, and, and not everybody would agree with what I'm about to say. Let's be really clear. But I will gladly debate this with any photographer, anytime, anywhere. The most important element of photographing a human being, it's this. Maybe they're looking at you. Maybe they're looking over here. Maybe it's a profile. Maybe they're looking down. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care where their face is. But the most important element is this. I'm also one of those really weird people, even if it's a nude, if the subject's face is in the picture, that's the most important element. And look, I'm human. I appreciate the body part. Sure. But this is what makes it work. Because if this isn't right, that naked body starts to make me feel really awkward. Right? So photographing a person in a wheelchair, the key is keep them relaxed, help them be confident, understand that they already are at a disability. Like, no pun intended, but they are. I mean, they're at a disadvantage here. They've got this disability. So it's your job to put them at ease, to make them feel confident. And you notice one of the things I left out, I'm going to run way over here. One of the things I left out of the conversation tonight, gang, and I shouldn't have, right? I talk about showing the energy you want. I talk about, you know, being the model, okay? You're all going to walk around saying that for now. It's like, be the model, right? Okay? Be real, not fake. Think about it. When a model comes into your studio or a bride or a portrait subject, they don't want a camera in front of your face. And what they're hearing, because all they're seeing then is like a gun aimed at them, right? And they don't want to be hearing, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, that's hot, that's hot, yeah, more, more, oh, come on, come on, come on, baby, yeah, 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 yeah. That's no model anywhere. That's not what they want to hear, ever. There's actually one thing, only one thing that they want to hear. Every now and then, they, they do want you to pause and tell them they're doing a good job. Sure, tell them nicely, okay? But there's actually one thing they do want to hear. And it's really easy for you to do it. And it's the best reward system ever. All your subject really wants to hear is click, 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 click. If the camera's clicking, things must be good. It's that simple, right? So forget what you see in television, forget what you see in the movies. Yeah, don't be like, you know, Mr. Artsy Fartsy and put your beret on and have a little mustache and be thinking, you know, you've got to be like, oh my God, that's so amazing. It's hot, baby. Yeah, no, don't, don't be that person because you're like a caricature. And I assure you, especially in today's world, you'll actually just make people uncomfortable, male or female for that matter. You're just going to make them uncomfortable, right? So good conversation. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we didn't get to talk about world photography today. I saw a couple people, Abe said that, or excuse me, Gabe said that he shot some images in a gym. I do hope you guys took some pictures, even if it was with your iPhones. I don't care. I took some pictures on world photography day, but, um, get out there, do some shooting. Hope to see you guys next week. Uh, some cool stuff coming up. In fact, I'm, I'm really liking this poll feature. So be prepared every week now when you show up, there's going to be a new poll. But next week, we're going to talk marketing for photographers. So any of you that are already making money or hoping to make money, or for that matter, you know what? Dreaming about making money. Come prepared with questions, right? Because obviously, I could talk for like six hours and we're not doing six hours. I want to talk about the things that are going to help you the most. And then in two weeks, we're going to start digging into this lighting stuff. This is like my new mission we have to simplify lighting and we can simplify lighting without all of us having to become experts in physics, without all of us having to do tons of math. But we need to be able to, you know, go online and look at a B&H photo or Amazon or walk into a camera store in our local area, which is even better yet because then you can see them and touch them. But we need to be able to look at one light and another light and easily compare the two lights and what they're going to do for us and how powerful they are. I have a way that I believe that will sincerely work. So I will be testing it 
with you guys. You're going to be the first ones to hear about it. And I'm going to want your honest feedback. So that's two weeks. All right. Have a great week. Take care, gang.